Asanteni sana kwa kuwa pamoja nasi kwenye uhusiano wa imani. Obrigado por sintonizar a Conexão da Fé. Gracias por sintonizarnos en la Conexión de Fe. Thank you for tuning in to Faith Connection, where we help you connect to God. Hi, I'm Pastor Steve Hobbins of the Lewis Avenue Baptist Church in Temperance, Michigan. I want to share with you a story that I believe will be a great encouragement to you today from God's Word. From the life of Peter in Acts chapter 12. In Acts chapter 12, Peter is now a mature Christian and uh, there's trouble coming to the church. In Acts chapter 10, Cornelius the centurion sends for him and he gets saved and what a joy to know that he's used of God that way. In Acts chapter 11, his friends question him and he shares what, how God was leading him and even his friends come around and acknowledge the fact that truly they are getting saved. Everything seems to be going very well, but all through this time there's still persecution of the Christians. In fact, one of the last verses uh, in, after Peter shares the story with his friends in Acts chapter 11 uh, of, of how God dealt with him, it says many were scattered abroad because of the persecution. That persecution intensifies here in Acts chapter 12, and I want you to uh, see some of these verses. In verse 1, the Bible says, Now about that time Herod the king stretched forth his hands to vex certain of the church, and he killed James the brother of John with the sword. And because he saw it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to take Peter also. Then were the days of unleavened bread. And when he had apprehended him, he put him in prison, and delivered him to four quaternions of soldiers to keep him, intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people. Peter, therefore, was kept in prison, but prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. And when Herod would have brought him forth the same night, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains, and the keepers before the door kept the prison. And behold, the angel of the Lord came upon him, and a light shined in the prison. And he smote Peter on the side and raised him up, and say, saying, Arise up quickly. And his chains fell off from his hands. Peter was able to escape, but he's going through problems. Did you notice in the persecution, a couple things in this passage, James was taken and James was killed. Peter was taken, and perhaps Peter thought he was killed. I'll, I'll explain a promise that God gave him earlier in his life a little bit later. But here we have Peter sleeping in prison with chains on between two soldiers. And uh, I bet it wasn't the nicest of situations. It wasn't comfortable, and I bet it didn't smell very nice. But how could Peter have such peace? Perhaps you've dealt with a problem in your life where you're, you need peace in your life. Your life is in turmoil, you live a life of fear, and, and you need peace. And I want to look at this passage today and ask you to consider this thought. What do we do when we are at peace in the midst of our problems? In Acts chapter 12, the story we just read, Peter is at peace. It's, this is not about when we're at peace. This is when we're at peace, right in the middle of our problems. How can we have peace? And we're going to look at several ways we can have peace today. I think it'll be a real encouragement to you. So let's look right away here at it. First of all, I want you to notice we can find peace, even though there's problems, in knowing that our peace is not dependent upon the removal of our problems. Just a moment ago, I drew your attention to the verses, first, uh, Acts 12, 1 through 7. Those problems didn't go away. Even though Peter got out of prison, Peter still has to leave town. He goes and he'll uh, visit the, the uh, Mary's house. Uh, uh, Rhoda is there and uh, John Mark uh, hits his house. But he goes there to this house where they're praying and uh, he has to leave town. Uh, his problems didn't go away. The persecution was still there. His friend James was still dead. Sometimes we, we get the understanding falsely, wrongly, that in order for us to have peace, we have to make our problems go away. We have to have a better wife. We have to have a better husband. We have to have better children. We have to have better parents. We have to have a better job. People have to treat us better. Our friends have to be nicer. We have to have a better church. If we had some of these things, if we had more money, we would have peace. No, peace can come even in the middle of our problems. We do not have to have our problems go away. 
We do not have to have the removal of our problems in order to have peace. In fact, Peter was asleep before he got out of prison. Uh, Peter was asleep. He was at peace in the middle of his problems. So don't make the mistake of thinking that we have to have our problems go away. I want you to notice that Peter had very real reasons to be afraid. James was beheaded. And, uh, you know, the Bible tells us a reason, I believe, that Peter had peace. And uh, uh, let me show you that in the second point here. We can find peace by remembering that God keeps his promises to us. You see the verse there on the screen, John 21. I want you to notice what that promise was to Peter. The Bible says, "Verily, just as Jesus talking to Peter, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, when thou, Peter, wast young, thou girdest thyself and walkest whither thou wouldest. But when thou shalt be old, thou shalt stretch forth thine hands, and another shall gird thee and carry thee whither thou wouldest not. This spake he, the Bible says, signifying by what death he should glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he saith unto him, follow me. So Jesus tells Peter, Peter, when you were young, you were the kind of person you'd go wherever you wanted, very headstrong. Uh, but when you're old, somebody's going to take you and this is how you are going to die. So Peter knows from the promise of God, from the promise of Jesus, that he is not going to die until he is old. So I don't know if Peter is remembering this while he's there in prison, but I can tell you for sure, if my friend James had just been killed and, and I was in prison and I was locked, four quaternions of soldiers, that's a lot of soldiers. And these two that are that you're chained to and you're asleep, I think I might start, start doubting the interpretation. Did I really, did God really say that? Did, did I really mean what I think he meant? And uh, you might start thinking, I wonder if I was wrong, but uh, Peter was at peace here. Another reason I'm sure he was uh, asleep here between the two soldiers is because he was really tired. But I also want you to notice what the Bible says here in verse 6. And when Herod would have brought him forth the same night, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers. In fact, he was so sound asleep, a light shined in the prison. And that didn't wake him up. They still had to smote him on the, hit him on the side to wake him up. He was at peace in the midst of his problems because he took God's promises at, at, as, as true. You know, we can have peace when we take God's promises. Well, I don't have a promise that something's going to happen to me when I'm old. No, that's not what I mean. Uh, we have promises like Hebrews 13, 5. Let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as ye have. For he hath said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. What a promise of God. God keeps his promises. That gives me peace. And uh, Peter was asleep because he took God. He believed God's word to be true. Here's another promise. Psalm 56, 3. What time I am afraid, I will trust in thee. Peter was afraid but he trusted in God. Psalm 139, verse 7, Whither shall I go from thy spirit, or whither shall I flee from thy presence? If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. If I take the wings in the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, and here's the promise, even there shall thy hand lead me, and thy right hand shall hold me. We're never out of God's care. This is the promise of God. Peter was at peace. He was asleep in the middle of his problems because he took God's promises as, at, at his word. Isaiah 41, 9. Thou whom I have taken from the ends of the earth and called thee from the chief men thereof and said unto thee, Thou art my servant. I have chosen thee and not cast thee away. Fear thou not, for I am with thee. I love that. Uh, God is with us. You know, I have the promise of heaven. The Bible says in 1 Peter that I have in, in chapter 1, I believe it's verse 3, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God through faith and salvation. I've, I have heaven. I have that promise. He said in John 14, I go to prepare a place for you. I will come again, receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. These promises we have, we can claim them. The promise, the precious promise of Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me besides the still waters. And the rest of that passage, which is so precious, the promise of Psalm 51, where when, when David is confessing and all the promises that God promises to confess, John 1, 9, 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. These are the promises of God. And we can take these promises 
at God's word. Peter was asleep because God told him when you're old, this will happen. And now, maybe he wondered what old was. Uh, what does God consider old? What do I consider old? But he took God's promise at his word. And so he was at peace in the midst of his problem. I want you to notice also, we can find peace by considering the inability of our opposition, by considering the inability of those who oppose us. Uh, verse 18, Verily I say unto thee, when thou, Peter, was young, thou girdest thyself and walkest whither thou wouldest. But when thou shalt be old, thou shalt stretch forth thine hands, and another shall gird thee and carry thee whither thou wouldest not notice. This spake he signifying by what death, Here's it, here it is, he should glorify God. The enemy wasn't in charge. Herod wasn't in charge. Yes, Herod killed James. But Herod wasn't in charge. He said, my death will glorify God. So even if I'm wrong, even if I die right now, my death is going to glorify God. See, the, his opposition, Herod, the enemy, could not stop God from being glorified because Peter wasn't going to die, but also because Peter knew even if I do die, God will be glorified. And Acts 12, 1, now about that time, Herod the king stretched forth his hands to vex certain of the church, and he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. Man, he's doing all this. No, Peter knew that Herod was not the one that was really in charge. In fact, in, in fact Acts chapter 4, where Peter was involved, he and John were threatened uh, after curing the lame man. Uh, heal, healing the lame man there. Uh, he, they were threatened. Stop doing this. And the prayer of the apostles was saying, uh, Acts 4, 24, And when they heard that, they lifted up their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, thou art God, which hast made heaven and earth and the sea and all that in them is, who by the mouth of thy servant David has said, Why did the heathen rage and the people imagine vain things? The kings of the earth stood up and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ, for of a truth against thy holy child Jesus, whom thou hast anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate with the Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together for to do, here it is, whatsoever thy hand and thy counsel determined before to be done. Peter knew they weren't in charge. The heathen rage, or I want to do this against God. They're not in charge. God is in charge. So Peter knew. We, we find peace by considering the inability of the opposition. Are, are you facing a hard time? Uh, are there those that are persecuting you? Uh, are you? Some are even in fear for their lives. But understand this. They're not in charge. Even if they kill you, your death can glorify God. I want you to understand that that God is the one in charge, and that gives us peace, knowing the inability of the opposition. Uh, a, a man that I knew years ago named John R. Rice uh, was in a, uh, an elevator, and a man pulled a gun on him and said, give me all your money. And he looked down at that gun and said, put that gun away. You can't scare me with heaven. He, he knew the inability of the opposition. He could only kill him once, and he's got eternity to spend with Christ. And, of course, the man uh, did not, and uh, it was an amazing story there. But I also want you to notice next here from this story, we can find peace, and this is difficult, by accepting God's will without having to know why he's done what he has done. We can, we can find peace by accepting that God's will is right without having to know why he's done what he's done. Let me explain what I mean. You see the first four verses, the reference listed there. Those are the verses where it explains that James was killed. Question, why was James taken and killed and not Peter? In fact, God, if God stopped Peter uh, from being taken... Couldn't he, uh, or from, from being uh, uh, killed, couldn't he have stopped Peter from being taken? Couldn't he have stopped James from being killed if he stopped Peter from being killed? All of these things are questioning God's will. And the truth of the matter is, I don't know exactly why God allowed James to die and Peter to escape. But I know this, God knows what he's doing. And God does not have to explain his will to me. And if I will live by faith and I will trust him, I find peace. God could have stopped all these things. Why did he allow these to happen? The truth of the matter is only God knows. That's called his sovereignty. God is able to do whatever he wants with what is his, and it's all his. My life is his. So 
we can find peace by just accepting God's will without having to know why. It's human nature to wonder why God does things. It's human nature to think, God, what are you doing? But we should never end there. We should give God a chance to explain, and if he doesn't explain, just accepting it. You know, that's what Habakkuk did, the Old Testament prophet. He complained against God. God, how long are you going to be silent? And God says, I'm going to answer. Yes, you're going to answer, but you're not going to like my answer. I'm going to bring the Babylonians in and they're going to judge you. And he was mad. Habakkuk was mad. And he challenged God. He said, this isn't fair. And he said, I, after he, why are you doing this? He questioned why. And then he went and sat on a hill and says to see what God would tell him when he is rebuked. It's one thing to be upset with God and to challenge God, but we have to give him, we have to let him explain. And sometimes he doesn't tell us why. And so therefore, when you can't trace his plan, you've got to trust his heart. You've got to say, all right, Father, I don't understand this, but I trust you. Peace comes from trusting God to be consistent with who he is rather than expecting him to do what I think he should do. God, here's what I think you should do, but I'm going to trust you to be consistent with who you are. I'm going to trust you to be the good God that I know you are, even if I can't understand it. And that gives me peace. Peace comes from not trying to control what I can't control. I can't control other people, and I can't control God. So therefore, peace comes from not trying to do that, from letting God be God and not having to control that, of letting God be God. It's called living by faith. And uh, that, that helps us when we understand, God, I don't know what you're doing, but I trust you. And I know God does not do anything except out of a heart of love for us. So if, if he knows what is best for me, he's omniscient. He wants what is best for me because he is love. And he is able to do what is best for me because he is all powerful. He's omnipotent. And because God is all knowing, God is love and God is all powerful. If he were only two of those, if God knew what was best for me and wanted what was best for me, but was not all powerful, he couldn't do it. If God could do what's best for me and wanted what's best for me, but was not all knowing, he wouldn't know what to do. And if God knew what was best for me and could do what was best for me, but didn't love me, he wouldn't have to do it. But God is all three of those, so therefore we can trust God. I want you to notice also, huh, this is great. So many Christians over the ages have found peace here. We can find peace in knowing that people are praying for us. While Peter's in prison, they are there praying for him. I don't know that they're praying for deliverance. deliverance. The Bible doesn't tell us this. But we know, uh, it says in verse 5, Peter therefore was kept in prison, but prayer was made without ceasing uh, of the church unto God for him. And uh, we, we know that they were praying for him without ceasing. It doesn't say what they were praying for. Maybe they were praying for deliverance. Maybe they were praying that his death would glorify God. Maybe they were praying for protection in prison. I don't know, but they were praying. Do you know many Christians have been encouraged by knowing somebody is praying for them? Have you prayed for some fellow Christians? Do they know it? You know, it's very encouraging when people tell me, Pastor Hobbins, I'm praying for you. I'm praying for your family. How encouraging. Now, I'm glad they're praying for me even before they told me. But if you're praying for people, tell them. It will encourage them. It helps us to find peace to know others are praying for it, to have a God that we can pray to. I want you to notice also, we can find peace in knowing that God's solutions are not limited by our imagination or by what we consider to be possible. I mean, think about it. Uh, it says in verse 7, And behold, the angel of the Lord came upon him, and a light shined in prison. Now, let me stop here for a moment. Peter's asleep. He's in prison, asleep. If God, if his solutions were confined to what I could think of, he'd come up with all, it would be a bad thing. I come up with all kinds of bad solutions. And then God solves something, and I think, oh, that's way better. That's much better than I thought of. God has not confined his solutions to my imagination. No, he can, or what I can consider possible. He did something that would be considered impossible. An angel of the Lord shows up in the prison, a light shine in prison, and he smote Peter on the side and raised him up, saying, Arise quickly, and his chains fell off from his hands. <clears throat> they just fell off. Maybe Peter was thinking, all right, it's God's will that I, I find 
uh, a little piece of wood that I can work on these chains. I don't think they're the kind of chains that that would work on. But maybe I can slip my hand out of this. Maybe I can be really quiet. Those would all be solutions according to our limited imagination. God says, no, I don't need that. He just shows up in prison. He shines a bright light on Peter. The guards didn't wake up. He didn't need to unlock the prison. <laughs> he takes the chains off because Peter needed them unlocked. He walks out. The gate just opens up. He's standing out there in the street. This is amazing. It says in verse 10, when they were past the first and the second ward, they came unto the iron gate that leadeth unto the city, which opened to them of his own accord. <laughs> After all that has happened, do you think Peter was surprised at that? I'd still be surprised at that. Wow, the gate just opened. Well, yeah, an angel appeared. Your chains fell off. Your bright light shined. Uh, all kinds of things are possible. But God is not limited. When I have problems and I think, oh, God, I can't figure out, and often I try to do this, I try to figure out how God can do it. But you know what brings me peace? Knowing that God does not have to think, what did he come up with? No, God comes up with his own plan. Uh, God knows exactly what he's going to do. He is not confined to the limits of my imagination or even to what I think is possible, and I find peace in that. The angel came in a locked prison, chains fell off, doors just opened. What a wonderful truth. Notice also, we can find peace, anybody can get this, when we obey God's word. When we live a life in obedience to God's word. Look at verse 8. And the angel said unto him, Gird thyself and bind on thy sandals. You get your clothes back on, bind your sandals. And so he did. If, if, listen, if an angel comes in there and uh, with, without anybody stopping him, just doesn't, he can just go right in. Bright light wakes Peter up. Couldn't he gird him? Couldn't he put his sandals on him? But God expected Peter to do, the angel expected Peter to do, what Peter could do. And he said, put, gird your clothes on, put your sandals on. And he did. He, he just obeyed. And he saith unto him, cast thy garment about, about thee and follow me. And he went out and followed him. God's word was more real to Peter than the chains or the soldiers. Could you see Peter arguing there? What do you mean follow you? It's locked. <laughs> no, Peter. Now, Part of this is Peter was still half asleep. In fact, he didn't realize what was going on until he was out in the street and then realized, oh, that, this really actually happened. Maybe he thought he was dreaming. But the point is, he did exactly what the angel told him to do, and the angel being sent by God. A life of peace comes from a life of obedience. Why was Peter in prison? Peter was in prison because he was obeying God. You know, sometimes we have problems in our life because we're doing what God said. It's not proof that we didn't do what God said. No, sometimes, when did the sea come on Galilee? When they obeyed him. He said, go out onto the sea. They went out of the sea, the storm came. Sometimes we think, oh, there's a storm in, in my life. I must not be obedient or we judge other people. That's not the case. So peace comes from living a life of obedience. That is the key to, our, to solving, our, getting out of our problems. Do exactly what God says to do. How do we know what God says to do? Well, we find it right in God's word. God's word reveals that. I want you to notice also next, also in the same verses here, we can find peace in realizing that God responds to faith. And this is encouraging to me. This is, I, this is why I have peace. But he's not limited by the size or the quality of my faith. God is pleased when we, he responds to faith, but he's not limited by my faith. Uh, the Bible says without faith, it is impossible to please him. And where does faith come from? Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So we live a life of faith. Verse 8, the angel said, uh, said unto him, gird thy sandals. I want you to notice verse 9. And he went out and followed him and wist not. That means he didn't know that it was true. Listen, faith is not the absence of doubt. Faith is doing what God said to do, even if you do doubt. Faith is responding to the word of God. And uh, we don't even have to know what God is doing for God to accomplish it. Peter was still half asleep. He wist not that it was true. God is not bound. He's not confined to my level of faith. He says, if we have faith as a grain of a mustard seed, he can do the miraculous. If, if our, my faith is not great because it's a, a level of faith or how much faith I have. My faith is great because it's in a great God. The only God. Jehovah God. And so we see here we can find peace in realizing God responds to faith. I may only have a little bit of it, but God is not limited by the size of our faith or the quality of our faith. What a great truth. Notice also, 
We can find peace when we give God a chance to bless our common sense rather than expecting him to overcome it. All right, let me explain what I mean here. Okay, so after Peter gets out of the prison and after he goes on, he goes through the street and he goes to the house where they are praying for him. And they don't believe it. In fact, it's kind of humorous. They're there praying all night for Peter to be freed. He comes to the house. He knocks on the door. Rhoda, a servant girl, answers the door. I, don't, I think she had probably something. She looked through a little hole in the door there. And uh, then she closed the door and went in and told everybody, Peter is here. And they didn't believe her. They were there. Talk about a lack of faith. They were there praying for Peter. Again, I don't know if they were praying for deliverance, but they're praying for Peter. Peter's standing at the door and they're telling her, knock it off. Why are we praying for him if he's standing at the door? <laughs> he had to knock again. This is kind of funny. So when he goes in, they're all loud. Wait a second. It's the middle of the night. That would cause a disturbance. Peter did two things here that show common sense. Verse 17 says, But he beckoning unto them with the hand to hold their peace, declared unto them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison. And he said, Go show these things unto James and the brethren. But Peter didn't. Peter didn't stay there to show them to James and the brethren. This is a different James. This is James, the half-brother of Christ, uh, Joseph's son uh, and, uh, and Mary's son. Jesus was, of course, only Mary's son. And, uh, but James, the new leader of the church here, the other James had been killed, we read about earlier in the chapter, James, the brother of, jo the brother of John. But Peter did two things that show his common sense. He told him to be quiet. Hey, if he can get him out of prison, if an angel can get him out of prison, an angel can protect him from, from the noise. But no, Peter told him to be quiet. That's called common sense. And then Peter, he says, and he departed and went into another place. Peter got out of the street. That was smart. He told them to be quiet as, as, and he left town. He was still not stupid just because he had been delivered from his problems. My point is, we, when we give God a chance to bless our common sense, we, that's why we have peace instead of expecting him to overcome it. I'm just going to do this. I'm just going to, I don't care if I get locked up for this. I'm going to do this. Well, sometimes there's a, the Bible tells us to be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. In other words, we need to have some wisdom. Can God bless and protect us? Yes. But God sometimes does that by giving us common sense. God, why didn't you protect me? And God says, I gave you common sense to protect yourself to not do foolish things. Now, sometimes we have to take a stand for the Lord and it does not matter what happens. This is just the way it needs to be. But so often, God expects us to use common sense. What a, what a story here in Acts chapter 12 about a man who's serving God and a man who finds peace in the middle of his problems. He did not have to have his problems go away. He found peace because he obeyed God's word. He found peace because he relied on the promises of God and knew that they were true. He found peace because of Jesus Christ. By the way, he is the Prince of Peace. He's the way to peace. Do you know him as your Savior? He is the source of peace. Thank you for tuning in to Faith Connection, where we help you connect to God.